Hello everyone. This is a response to Michael Millerman's video about Heidegger's views on Spengler. Or it's not so much a response as a kind of comment in regards to some of Heidegger's critiques and how they tie into some common misconceptions about Spengler's philosophy. I'll link to Millerman's video below. My aim is not to criticize Heidegger's philosophy as such, but only to make clear Spengler's philosophy through Heidegger's criticism, some of which, to be sure, is bordering on personal attacks. In this, Heidegger is part of the mainstream critique of Spengler. Critics often posit that Spengler was a hack or an essentialist, while at the same time, these critics find it hard to explain why he seems to be right about so much. I will therefore try to focus on the more constructive and unique part of Heidegger's criticism. To be clear, my aim is not to criticize Heidegger per se, but to point out two of his main criticisms that I think are wrong. First, that Spengler was blind to the historically relativist position of his own philosophy. Secondly, and this is a common misconception, that Spengler's view of history is biological. Heidegger takes issue with Spengler's proclaiming that there can be no new ideas in our age. He points out that Spengler both contradicts himself and makes his book the center of the universe when he claims that, quote unquote, there is no actually new thought in so late a time, and at the same time states that his view of history is completely new. Indeed, this is a contradiction. We have to dive into Spengler's view of history to understand what's at stake here. Spengler's idea is that Western culture had expressed itself fully by the end of the 19th century, and that from that moment we have been living in what he calls civilization. In practice, this means that all the heavy lifting was done from the Middle Ages to the dawn of what we call modernity. And in a way, it is true that on the eve of civilization around the year 1800, everything that Western culture has expressed was fulfilled. Individualism, the university, capitalism, industry, the scientific method, secularism, democracy, humanism, classical music, imperialism, architecture, etc. Once these had been expressed, the later developments and discoveries were just a question of time. Indeed, Spengler's conception of civilization is identical to the concept of modernity. The only difference is that whereas modernity implies a combination of all history into this new third age, Spengler sees this as the final stage of a particular civilization, the Western one. Therefore, he claims that our modernity isn't unique, but rather that all cultures reach a stage of modernity which is characterized by a certain dead pragmatic logic. Civilization or modernity emerges when the expression of a certain culture has reached its full potential and starts to petrify. For Spengler, ancient Greece was the culture phase of classical civilization and the Roman Empire its modernity. All that was artistic and thoughtful in the Roman age was simply a reboot of Greek culture. What Rome brought to the table was imperialism, militarism, massive cities, bread and circuses, engineering and business. Spengler sees his philosophy as a realization of what has already happened. In this, he is purely a modernist and therefore himself an expression of civilization, of his time. Indeed, this is what the pioneers of the 20th century were all saying, and something Spengler comments on in a kind of meta-analysis. He is simply stating the facts, so to speak. Consider the architects of the early 20th century. They were almost to the word, and before Spengler, stating that in modernity architecture cannot reflect the older forms of culture, which had been the case in the 19th century. The early modernists opposed the historicism of the previous century. How is it possible, they asked, that the age of steam, industry and science is represented by neo-Renaissance and neo-Gothic buildings, when we have steel, glass and technology to bring us whatever we want? Hence, the aesthetic of the machine age was brought into being. In Spenglerian fashion, these architects were actively creating that which had already taken place. Were these individuals the harbingers of change, or simply expressing 
what was already a civilizational fact. Eventually, modernism evolved into the only thing it could evolve into, pure civilization, that is, pure minimalist surfaces. Spengler even echoes the modernist idea when he writes, quote, I would sooner have defined mind-begotten forms of a fast steamer, a steel structure, a precision lathe, the subtlety and elegance of many chemical and optical processes, than all the pickings and stealings of present-day arts and crafts, architecture and painting included. I prefer one Roman aqueduct to all Roman temples and statues." End quote. Elsewhere Spengler says, quote, I can only hope that men of the new generation may be moved by this book to devote themselves to techniques instead of lyrics, the sea instead of the paintbrush, and politics instead of epistemology. Better they could not do. End quote. Some have criticized Spengler for being a barbarian, for simply stating as destiny that which he is actively advocating. This is both true and false. Like the modernist Spengler is advocating this because to him this is the way things are going to go and he can only influence the creative form within the limits of civilization. As he puts it, freedom means, quote, to do not this or that, but the necessary or nothing, end quote. Therefore, the modernists become an expression of civilization in its will to cut away dead forms, in this case, the historicist styles of the 19th century. At the same time, Spengler saw this as the only probable way forward. And every art critic and architect who today say architecture must reflect its time, therefore agrees with Spengler. According to Spengler, his time was in a condition where the culture was, quote, playing a tedious game with dead forms to keep up the illusion of living art, end quote. And this is even more true for our own age. And no wonder, since the civilizational process moves ever more away from art towards technology. In this way, Spengler called for a kind of formalization, a recognition that art was in fact dead and that the only worthwhile expression is technology and often sheer scale. During the 2010s, this is something that has become all, all the clearer to us. We live in a loop of reproduction, LARPing, nostalgia and reboots, a process that set in in the late 2000s which is eerily close to Spengler's prediction that the quote-unquote finishedness of Western civilization would be achieved by the year 2000. Spengler saw this as our equivalent of the Roman age. Spengler summarizes his mythology best in the introduction when he states, quote, What concerns us is not what the historical facts which appear at this or that time are, per se, but what they signify, what they point to by appearing, end quote. For example, what does it signify when architecture suddenly loses all its ornaments, its very form and aesthetics, and moves towards pure theory and minimalism? Spengler would say that this is civilization cutting off the dead forms of culture, that is, the historicist styles of the 19th century and forming a final petrified style that will be repeated for eternity until the civilization ends. Here, of course, the art critic or the university professor might say that Spengler is wrong on this or that aspect of the modernist aesthetic. But does this refute the overreaching idea of what modernism signifies by appearing at all? It's not the important question here what it means when Neo-Renaissance is replaced by Bauhaus. Heidegger acknowledges the error of this kind of criticism of Spengler when he says, quote, To be sure, a guild of serious researchers computed the quote-unquote errors of the book. This had the remarkable result that since then, historiography itself has been conducted more and more within the horizon of Spengler's view and schemata. And even where it was naturally able to make quote-unquote more correct and quote-unquote more exact constatations, end quote. Spengler would counter by saying that this is the way history will be done in the age of civilization. And indeed, this is the postmodern way of understanding history. I'm using the, in my 
opinion inaccurate term postmodern here to describe our age, not to point to postmodernist theory. Although Spengler is clearly present in thinkers like Foucault. Spengler suggests that we need to detach ourselves from the form world in the same way we have done in regards to nature. This is a possibility that until now Spengler claims we have been unaware of. This is the kind of arrogance and claim to objectivity that Heidegger and others have criticized Spengler for. What it actually points to, though, is our heightened self-awareness that gives our civilization both the tools for study of the facts while simultaneously leading to, the, to a detachment from reality to the point of schizophrenia. For Spengler, culture is a less self-aware force of pure creativity and expression, while the onset of critique, doubt, skepticism, questioning and abstractions is the hallmark of the emergence of civilization, of science and criticism, but at the same time the beginning of the end of creativity and art. Spengler has not been wrong here either. Self-awareness in our own civilization has quickly evolved from a necessary distance to an inability to escape a kind of meta-commentary on everything and anything. Irony and nihilism is the ideology of the day, and this is especially true for the postmodern age. Self-referentiality is everywhere. Criticism has evolved into a fully-blown iconoclasm and a hatred for culture and history. For Spengler, this is the hostility of the cosmopolitan world city towards the old culture that once made a city possible in the first place. The detachment from history and civilizational self-awareness is something Spengler sees as both inevitable and an opportunity to untangle the meaning of history, that is, for us the meaning of the history of Western culture. Heidegger states, as a critique that Spengler needs to be understood, quote, according to his own doctrine, namely as a symptom of his era, end quote. And this is exactly what Spengler is also saying. In a petrified state, civilization can only reflect on itself and its past, for it is no longer going anywhere. This is what Spengler saw as the future of historiography and the new aspect of his own thought. This would not have been the outlook of the young West back in the 13th century, in the same way that a teenager cannot have the same view of life as an older man looking back on his life. What Spengler is saying is that we are the older man looking back, and for us this is the correct view to hold. With a super heightened self-awareness, civilization can become aware of its own historical process, which is what Spengler is striving at. Quote, this is what has to be viewed, and viewed not in the eyes of the partisan, the ideologue, the up-to-date novelist, not from this or that standpoint, but in a high, time-free perspective, embracing whole millenniums of historical world forms, if we are really to comprehend the great crisis of the present." End quote. Yet Heidegger claims that, quote, Europe is the actualization of the decline of the West, end quote. He seems to suggest, in accordance to Spengler's own scheme, that the overhanging doom is in some sense the result of Spenglerian thinking. That is, we are not the older man looking back, but the idea of the old man looking back is the result of Spenglerian thought. Although Heidegger refers in his footnotes to Spengler's text on pessimism, he still misrepresents Spengler's idea of decline when he states that, quote, the presupposition of a historical downgoing is greatness and that the West will not go down primarily because it is too weak for that, not because it is still strong." End quote. Spengler, however, equated decline not with a fall, but with fulfillment. Civilization is the become in contrast to culture's becoming. Civilization is an achievement. Rome also remained an impressive empire for centuries after Augustus. Yet classical culture had reached its fulfillment, and with the reigns of the Caesars, it began its slow decline. Spengler did not claim that the West was going down, but rather that it was petrifying. Furthermore, Heidegger here almost outshines Spengler in his caricature of Spenglerianism when he sp states that the West is too weak to fall, 
What is this if not pessimism? It is almost as if Heidegger sees the decline of the West as reflecting the kind of zeitgeist that he identifies as the true reason for the uneasy climate in Europe. In short, Heidegger sees Spengler as an, quote, expression of today's cultural soul, end quote. He uses Spengler's language and method to explain Spengler himself as an expression of the age. And here I think Heidegger goes astray. That which Spengler sees as the zeitgeist of a certain stage of civilization, Heidegger considers to be brought about and expressed by Spengler himself. What Spengler was trying to capture was modernity itself as an inevitable process, while Heidegger was pointing to the zeitgeist as an expression of a temporary mindset. We can therefore state that Spengler is simply reframing modernity. He boldly states what is possible and therefore what will happen in the age of civilization. And to some extent, anyone would agree with him. We cannot go back to believing in God, building Romanesque cathedrals and living under disinterested and decentralized government. They are dead forms now transformed into socialism, skyscrapers and the secular state. Another quarrel Heidegger has with Spengler is that he apparently romanticizes facts. And indeed Spengler makes a distinction between facts and truth. Quote, a fact is something unique, something which has really existed or will really exist. A truth is something which can exist in a possibility without ever entering reality. Truths can be found in a doctoral dissertation in philosophy. Flunking a doctoral examination is a fact. End quote. This approach is what Heidegger calls Spengler's version of Nietzsche's inversion of Platonism. For Heidegger, Spengler's facts are quote-unquote generalities of mere opinion and quote-unquote the most blind romanticism. But what does Spengler mean with his idea of facts? Following Spengler's approach, we might say that, for example, World War I as an event is a fact but what is the truth of the world war? What is the truth of nationalism, Christianity or the 19th century? Trying to see these as truths is pointless according to Spengler, as it means approaching them as concepts or eternal ideas of being instead of becoming, as a snapshot or cognizing. Simply put, as world as nature. For Spengler they can only be viewed as world as history, that is, historically. Nationalism, for example, is not a dictionary definition, but a historical process. It is destiny. Spengler saw the Western attempts to establish universal and timeless truths as a symptom of our civilization and nothing else. The West is always looking for, quote, the solution of the question. It was never seen that many questioners implies many answers, that any philosophical question it's really a veiled desire to get an explicit affirmation of what is implicit in the question itself. End quote. Spengler continues, quote, When Plato speaks of humanity, he means the Hellenes in contrast to the barbarians, which is entirely consonant with the ahistoric mode of the classical life and thought. When, however, Kant philosophizes, say, on ethical ideas, he maintains the validity of these ideas for men of all times and places." End quote. The Western will to always speak for all of humanity of universal things that are valid over space and time is that which Spengler claims to be the great blindness of the West, its tendency to take its own cultural essence as the universal truths for all places and time. Spengler calls this the Ptolemaic system of history, which he contrasts to his own system which he regards as a Copernican discovery in the historical sphere. He dethrones the West as the central nave of history, and therefore the warped scheme of ancient medieval modern, which he replaces with the self-contained history of different cultures and civilizations. Basically, he makes all epochs equal in the sense that he won't consider our civilization modern and the ancient Greeks old, as in their time, the Greeks were modern and the ancient Egyptians old. Hence, 
There are no great truths for Spengler, but only facts that point to certain things by appearing at specific points of time. It is in the relation between facts and truths that Spengler's infamous biological view of history comes into play. Heidegger also claims that Spengler's vision is based on quote, nothing but a crude biological interpretation of history, end quote. This is a common mistake even among those who find Spengler interesting, and even among those who might call themselves Spenglerians. However, Spengler based his whole view of history on the fundamental opposition between history and nature. He used biological language simply as an analogy. This is why I think he is so important today. In our age, increasingly, things that are clearly ideological are explained by pointing to biology or nature, either to our prehistorical caveman hardwiring or to some post-humanist future. Liberalism is based in the ideas of natural rights, science and universal truth. Problems hence increasingly seem to be about brains, human nature and evolution. Ideas about humanism and human rights dominate the discourse. No one ever questions whether the underlying metaphysical and ideological structure is sound. Indeed, no one even seems to know it's there. In Spenglerian terms, this very condition is the result of pure civilization, when it becomes so myopic in its own views, so self-centered, that it mistakes its own internal logic, in this case the Western, for the universal truth of the entire planet over space and time. When Heidegger quotes Spengler as saying, quote, humanity is for me a zoological greatness, end quote, it simply means that humanity as such has no goal. Only single cultures have what Spengler calls a goal, a unity of soul, will and experience. This is the distinction between nature and history. For Spengler, humanity is, quote, one of the organisms of the Earth's surface, end quote. In that sense, primitive tribes and farmers have no culture and live a kind of biological historyless existence. When cultures form, history begins. Culture is history. The human race in itself is timeless and eternal, just like a forest or the sea. Thus, understanding history as a kind of progress of humanity makes no sense. Understanding the art, industry and thought of a certain time is purely historical, within the cosmos of that culture. When the culture dies, its people return to being member only of the human race from previous to being members of both the human race and the particular culture. Trying to understand a culture from the perspective of nature is impossible in Spengler's view. In that way, Spengler's view of history is not only unbiological, it is anti-biological. For Spengler, the human being itself is a timeless creature. He states, quote, Mankind has no aim, no idea, no plan, any more than the family of butterflies or orchids. Mankind is a zoological expression or an empty word. Cultures have their own people, languages, truths, gods, but there is no aging mankind, end quote. Spengler criticizes the fact that, quote, history was seen as nature in the objective sense of the physicist and treated accordingly. And it is to this that we must ascribe the baneful mistake of applying the principles of causality, of law, of system, that is, the structure of rigid being, to the picture of happenings. It was assumed that a human culture existed just as electricity or gravitation existed, and that it was capable of analysis in much the same way as these." End quote. In Spengler, the world as history is something else, it is becoming, a process of which one cannot take a snapshot to study scientifically as one would study a rock. In this way, cultures are historical organisms, separate from nature, which makes Spengler's view strongly non-biological. Quote, it is history that is the truly natural, and the exact, mechanically correct nature of the scientist 
that is the artificial conception of world by soul. End quote. That is, Spengler gives our historical hardwiring the meaning that so many today attempt to give our biological caveman hardwiring. Spengler would here simply state that the idea of giving our caveman hardwiring meaning is a result of the Western outlook, and by simply emerging, it points to the fact that history is the origin and science the product of it. Our present day liberal worldview very much functions this way. Everything is presented as issues relating to the planet and human biology. It is easier to envision the destruction of the natural world and mankind than to escape even for a second the mental frame that casts our problems in this light. For Spengler, this would mean the final victory of ideology. In a way, Spengler supplants nature with history. That is, his history acts as a kind of nature, a separate cosmos, which means that we are as free from history as we are from nature. To be a member of a culture is to be a part of a destiny, which means only certain things can and therefore will happen. We are all members of the human race, organisms of the Earth's surface, as Spengler puts it. But this has no meaning as to how history will unfold. What would it otherwise mean to say that something is outdated before its time or typical of our age? In the world of biology, such historical concepts don't even exist. To what extent we are free from history is another discussion, and one that is as difficult as the one relating to our freedom from nature. This is what makes Spengler so offensive and therefore pessimistic to the modern worldview, as this is a worldview that simply assumes that anything is possible and individuals are completely free. The fact that so many modern scholars have been taken aback by Spengler proves the point that from a certain perspective Spengler is indefensible. Heidegger is right to point out that Spengler's philosophy risks a meaninglessness that threatens our understanding of the world. This is what Heidegger means when he says that in Spengler nothing at all is dangerous anymore and that the rudest slap in the face no longer has any meaning. This is the same problem I highlighted in my video about Foucault, namely that for Spengler, quote, every observer thinks solely as a representative of his own particular time, end quote. Yet those who oppose this view are often those who seek to establish universal truths or those who are the most captured by their own time. The woke movement or an individual like Elon Musk could, for example, be said to be pure expressions of our age in the same way Christianity or Napoleon once were. For both Spengler and Foucault, the historical interpretation is an attempt to solve the subjective objective problem by making it historical. Still, there is a link between what we normally consider to be moral matters and what Spengler sees as historically determined. For example, why is defending absolute monarchy today no longer seen as legitimate? Is it a result of careful moral deliberation by the individual or has it been given to us historically? Spengler would say that we should not have absolute monarchy because it is no longer suitable for our age and has therefore been discarded. But there is no iron law stating that monarchy is always bad. It depends on the situation and the epoch. There are clear limits to this kind of thinking, but at the same time certain attitudes and worldviews seem to be hardwired into the DNA of a culture. And it is this that Spengler is pointing to. The Faustian core of the West is what set our culture in motion, and it will be with us until the end. Thanks for watching. See you soon.